I'm VP from Seven Signal. Uh, I'm based in Ohio. Uh, Seven Signal does uh, Wi-Fi performance uh, products, agents, and uh, sensors. I will uh, today talk about Wi-Fi transceivers. I'm not talking about our products, but uh, technologies which are uh, impacting uh, Wi-Fi performance, especially focusing to their uh, this time to the hardware side, transmitters and receivers, so transceivers. So that's the um, focus of uh, my presentation. Okay, I have given a couple of presentations here as well before, so um, you may uh, have seen some of them. If not, anyway, you can download all my materials from this address. It will ask your name. Um, but uh, you will get to download all of these and then as well the material uh, for today. So if you want to have the material and see you know, more details, um, you can download it. It may be a little bit hard to see from the distance, uh, everything always. But my topics usually are around performance, so um, this time as well, another angle uh, to the performance aspects of Wi-Fi. And um, there's been already today some in, in, interesting talks. And uh, uh, for example, uh, this uh, dual five gigahertz AP model and AP approach. Uh, so, so after I cover kind of um, the architecture and uh, I have as well a case kind of uh, where I have considered a little bit, uh, you know, what might be consider, what might be causing this uh, this degradation if it's there uh, when when using two uh, five gigahertz radios very nearby. So that's towards the end of the presentation. Okay. So, um, well, Wi-Fi is about Mac and physical layer. So uh, Mac is, you know, you know the Mac protocols there. They are the beacons, probes, and so on. Uh, when moving to the physical side, uh, we have there the uh, digital processing, uh, including spatial streams, subcarriers, channel coding, uh, to name a few. So the output from this digital phase is in practice uh, something that feeds uh, uh, digital to analog conversion, which outputs a voltage eventually, which becomes then the signal which will be transmitted. So uh, we will be focusing uh, onto this physical and analog slash RF uh, aspects in this presentation. Okay, so here is the basic configuration. Um, obviously, pretty simple and basic. Uh, but APs have two radios, clients have one radio. So a client can talk only either to the 2.4 or to the 5 gig at once. We haven't seen yet such clients which would be simultaneously be able to use 2.4 and 5. It would be really handy, but they haven't been yet available. So uh, each radio, for example here dual band radio, it has one or more streams. And these streams include transmitters and receivers. So we are going to drill in to these different blocks here so that we are going to go first to the stream and then to the blocks and the, the, you know, the blocks of the transmitter and receiver and what are the functions of those uh, blocks. Okay, so Wi-Fi radio is half duplex as everyone knows. So there is a transmitter chain, there is a receiver chain. And the receiver is on unless there is something which is being transmitted. And when there is something being transmitted, there is a switch which switches the transmitter on. And, uh, and that's how it works. Uh, transmit and receive take turns. And there's a physical kind of, or physical or semiconductor switch there, switching between the transmitters and receivers. So drilling in further into this, so uh, this is one stream. So these are the blocks that are there in a stream. So there is a transmitter chain, uh, and then there is a receiver chain. So uh, 
when the uh, bit stream comes from uh, the uh, baseband processing part, uh, it first hits the digital analog converter, which converts it to analog signal, basically sine wave, which is modulated. That goes through uh, some, uh, some filtering, and uh, obviously it's not yet at that point at the target frequency, which is 2.4 or 5 gigahertz. So it has to be up-converted to target frequency, and um, a, a component called mixer is used for the up-conversion. And after the up-conversion, uh, we need to give some more power for the signal. So, so there is uh, typically one or more amplification stages which amplify the signal further before it goes to the antenna. <laughs> typically there are two separate transmitters for the 2.4 and 5, and uh, that's because because the RF frequency is so much different that you get better efficiency if you separate those streams. Now, you can do as well wideband transmitters and wideband receivers, but it's much harder to do uh, you know, wide broadband from, from 2.4 to almost 6 gigahertz and have a kind of optimal performance for, for uh, all that band. So, uh, final stage basically there, combining the 2.4 and 5 uh, bands is a deplexer, which is a low loss way of combining two frequencies together before they go to the antenna. So that you don't need to have two antennas, but you combine them together. If you would use a normal kind of uh, power combining, you would always lose at least 3 dB of the transmit power, but with deplexers you don't. Okay. So that goes out to the antenna. Now, when the signal comes in, First, it goes again through to the deplexer, which splits the signal to the 5 gigahertz and 2.4 gigahertz uh, receiver chains. So the first thing uh, there in the receiver is a low noise amplifier. So you give, uh, amplify the signals, uh, you then do the down conversion, so you move from the, you know, the RF frequency to the lower frequency, do some filtering, there you have some automatic gain control because you need to set as well the signal level which goes to the, this AD conversion uh, to certain target level to make it work optimally. So in between there you have a frequency synthesizer which is the, um, feeding the, these down converters and up converters so that you get the signal to your target frequency. Okay, next we are going to look at some of these modules individually, what do they include, what do they do, what's critical for uh, transceiver performance. So first one here is the uh, analog to digital or digital to analog conversion. So thinking about the digital to analog part, uh, you, f you feed this uh, converter uh, bit stream which describes signal levels that you want to get out of the converter. And uh, what the converter does is that it puts out the voltage. So essentially, it will put out a sine voltage, you know, sine wave, but it's modulated signal. So um, then in the receive direction, it will do the same, but uh, it will digitize the input. Basically, your RF signal, which is down converted, will be digitized, and then uh, it will be fed to the baseband processing uh, for, for demodulation and, uh, you know, decoding. So, so this is the first and last stage uh, of the receiver. The next one here is mixer, the uplink and downlink conversion. So how you do this conversion is that you uh, feed a certain high frequency to the mixer, which is close to your target frequency, and then you uh, feed your modulated signal uh, to this mixer, and there is a, this kind of mixing uh, happening there that your um, modulated and up-converted uh, signals appear near to your, uh, let me see if I get this to work. Yeah, so uh, here, so you have your 
local oscillator, which is the synthesizer signal, and then this is your modulated signal at low frequency. When these two are mixed together here, uh, the output is something uh, you know around this frequency, and then there is actually a number of output signals, and you have to filter it and make sure that you are using only the right one. So. So, so this is how you get to the RF frequency and you get out of the RF frequency. As well, when you change channels, you are stepping this synthesizer and this, this uh, frequency uh, there so that you are receiving the right channel at the time. Okay, next one, power amplifier. So this is the uh, stage which uh, is before the, the antenna. So, so you want to amplify the signal to your target level. So some important characteristics for power amplifier are its compression point. So amplifier, you put in a signal and it amplifies uh, by certain dBs and then you get higher signal out. So output compression point is basically your input level increases here, your output increases here. So typically it is a linear relationship, but when the Amplifier is running out of, uh, you know, uh, power uh, or capabilities. It starts to compress, and the output doesn't anymore increase linearly compared to the input. And there you have your compression point. So you have one dB compression point when you are one dB off the target amplification or target power level. So linearity is another important measure, and uh, and. Um, that's usually described with the third order in the, in the third order intercept point. So you want to usually stay away from this compression point. So the signal is modulated. So it has peaks and valleys. Basically, typically the OFDM signal has 10 to 10 dB peak to average rates range. So so if you operate your average power level here, it actually goes like that, and the peaks. Uh, come close to this compression point. So if you can go too close, then it means that uh, then it means that you are you start to distort, distort the signals. So you don't want to go there too close to the compression point. As well, when you feed in amplifier too high signal levels, the fundamental harmonics basically meaning uh, you know you are 2.4, the 4.8, and so on and so on. They start to increase. And uh, that's not a good thing, obviously, as well. So power amplifier, how, how, what happens to the signal when it gets distorted? So uh, two things here. So you have uh, these sidebands. They start to increase. So the modulation spectrum starts to kind of grow here sideways. And uh, the same thing, what happens uh, with the constellation is that this is your back of like 11 dB when you are in a safe region. You are not clipping the signals in any conditions. And then when you start to reduce the back off, you see that the signal gets distorted. So you want to stay out from the compression or even nearby being there. Okay. Then deplexer. So three ports, you have one feeding both frequencies and then separating them to two different branches. So uh, up there, that's 2.4. You can see low loss up to 2.5 gigahertz. And then uh, the other one, there is a high loss at lower frequencies, but low loss at 5 gigahertz. So you can combine the signals and, uh, and feed them to one, uh, one part, basically. Low noise amplifier. OK, so this is the first stage. Uh, in your receiver. Of course, you have the antenna and you have a cable. And the, of, those should be as short as possible if you want to optimize your receiver sensitivity. So all the loss you have before the low noise amplifier will add or degrade your sensitivity by the amount of you know, cable loss you have there. So uh, the most important thing with the, uh, with the LNA is that you have low noise figure and you have certain gain. And uh, after you do that, uh, the, the stages after this uh, low noise amplifier have much less meaning to the uh, noise figure of the whole receiver.
So uh, receiver noise floor, uh, and this is mostly from the kind of bandwidth and thermal point of view. So, um, so the wider bandwidth you have, you, the more noise you receive as well, and the harder it becomes kind of to decode. You have a lower signal to noise ratio uh, with wider bandwidth. And uh, what happens to the signal when it goes to the low noise amplifier is that the signal gets amplified, but the noise gets amplified as well because the amplifier, of course, doesn't know whether it's noise or signal, so it amplifies both of them. So uh, your signal, or your noise gets amplified by the amount of noise figure um, you have there, and as well uh, by the amount of gain that you apply in the uh, first stage. So your LNA should have low noise figure and sufficient amplification so that it can clean up the uh, signal and then the, the signal to noise ratio in the receiver remains good while it goes through the different uh, uh, phases there, like down conversion. Then automatic, automatic gain control. So, so this is used to set the received signal strength to the right level uh, for different elements in the receiver chain. So there is a power detector which detects what kind of signal level you are receiving. And then there are attenuators or variable gain amplifiers uh, which are controlled with this signal. So in Wi-Fi, of course, because there are usually no filters, or at least there are no filters in the in-band, you know, whole five gigahertz band is amplified and so on, uh, then any signal which is strong there will actually trigger uh, this, you know, or set the uh, AGC uh, amplification levels. Okay. Then uh, finally, final element here is uh, frequency synthesizer. So, so this is your signal source that you use to uh, convert your modulated signal to the target frequency or convert it back to your uh, lower frequency. So synthesizer basically is a, a phase-locked loop, meaning that uh, there is an oscillator, voltage-controlled oscillator, which is running roughly the right frequency at 2.4 or 2.3 gigahertz. Uh, then there is this other circuitry. There is another low-frequency oscillator here, which is very stable, usually a crystal oscillator. So what happens here is that this signal is uh, divided down uh, and and this signal is divided down to a target frequency or kind of comparison frequency. And then those two signals, uh, there is a phase detector which tries to keep them um, at the same phase. They are different frequency, but same phase. And, and that locks the, this oscillator uh, frequency, what you have here. So you get a very stable signal, which has the same stability as the reference oscillator, uh, and then still it's at the high RF frequency. Okay, so, so those are the different elements. So how does this, you know, all come together in a full transceiver? So, so there are a number of impairments in the transmitter and receiver chain, which uh, basically come up from the non-idealities of these different uh, stages there. So, uh, so the frequency synthesizer and the modulation adds some in in inaccuracy to the, uh, to the RF signals. Uh, there is a noise figure as well in the transmitter, uh, which can be critical. Uh, eventually, transmitter has to be able to put out very clean signal as it was modulated with no distortion, because it will get a ton of distortion and problems when it hits the air and is propagated over the air. So you don't want to transmit anything other than a very clean signal from your transmitter. Yes? Uh, just have, have a question. On the receiver side, you see when uh, like iPhones come out, the iFixit guys take them apart. There's just like one Wi-Fi system chip that does everything. On the access point of all those boxes, which are in one chip, or are they separate components, 
or is that all just included in? I have an example coming up. Excellent question. <laughs> Thanks for asking. It's, I think, the next slide. <laughs> Good timing. Yep. Okay, so for the receiver side, uh, for the receiver side, then uh, you have the LONOS amplifier, uh, which is critical for the receiver sensitivity. So that's probably the most important thing. Then you have the, the um, kind of the automatic gain control, how well it can keep your power levels on the target levels so that the, all the elements work in a linear manner and don't distort your received signal. So if you are feeding a very high signal level to your client, you know, client device or access point, uh, you are basically then, your uh, automatic gain control is trying to lower the signal levels. And if it's a low signal level, then it's trying to amplify them as much as possible. Another example, so, so this is a, you know, a USB Wi-Fi adapter. So now we can, you know, consider what do we see there? What are the modules where they are? And before we do that, there is excellent information available in internet. Uh, from FCC web pages, you can see all the type approval documents and search for anything. So, so that's very powerful. And the other one is Wikidevi, which is an incredible, incredible uh, source of information. So uh, the, what I'm showing here, this is from Wikidevi and uh, FCC uh, uh, pages. Okay, so this uh, USB adapter uses a uh, Realtek chipset. And uh, in this case, this chip includes pretty much everything here. The, those, all the modules that we just discussed uh, went through. Basically, there is internal power amplifier, there is internal low noise amplifier, uh, there is internal analog and digital conversion, then there are those chains integrated there. But you can as well use external circuitry for this. Uh, because it's hard to have optimum performance uh, from the same semiconductor technology that you use for the digital circuitry as for the, you know, the RF. So, so that's why often the power amplifiers and the front ends might be a separate chip, like is the case in this example. So those chains, what Keith asked, they are all integrated typically to one chip so you, you can have a lot of transceiver and receiver chains. If you have 4x4 four four AP, uh, you have uh, two radios basically, one for each band, and each of them has four chains. So you have eight chains of transceiver, tra uh, transmitters and receivers. Okay, so this is the, what's inside this uh, USB adapter. So, so you can see here, this is the uh, Realtek chip which includes the the, the Mac and the, you know, the physical, the uh, baseband processing part. And uh, here is a power amplifier chip. So this feeds signal to this one, which feeds it forward. Here's an LNA chip, which feeds the signal, amplifies it, and feeds into this chip here. So there are two streams. One stream here, another stream here. And when expanding this further, uh, you can see here is the switch for transmit and receive functions. So, so uh, you either transmit or receive, not simultaneously, and then the antenna, antenna connections. When, when it's about a phone or some small device, these functions are integrated typically so that you, have a, you may have a bare chips which are connected to a module, and with the module has very, some very, very small uh, wires which tie it all together. So that, that way you minimize the size uh, of your full, you know, radio. All right. So, so this is now, you know, one way to kind of consider how, how to use this, this kind of architecture concepts and and, and what does it mean to the performance? So, so I have here this one case, uh, you know, having two transmitters in the same band co-located nearby each others. So from, you know, this theory point of view, from the receiver and transmitter theory point of view, what might be happening there? 
So we know that it, you know, it's possible to do that and it works, but then there are a number of aspects which impact to this performance of this kind of transmitter. Okay. So you have, uh, you have the antennas co-located. So obviously when one is transmitting, it's hitting the receiver straight out next to it. And there isn't much attenuation in between. So in this example, uh, here is channel 36 and the modulated spectrum. Uh, here is channel 60. And, uh, and uh, when you transmit here and you try to receive here, then uh, there are a number of things that can impact that function. So one of the key things is the wideband noise from this transmitter. So uh, there is no one channel filter. Uh, it's not possible or feasible to implement one channel filter to tr uh, transmitter. So it means that you can switch the channel across your band, and, uh, but the result is that the, you know, the noise level doesn't go to zero here, it just continues. And the more power you put out here, the wider is the band here, the, the further away you have increased noise level. Which then, when, when these go by, you know, by their own decision, uh, then, then when this is trying to receive, uh, there is this noise present from this other transmitter because it's transmitting you know, maximum power level when this one is trying to receive, like 20 dBm out here and minus 75 trying to receive here, something like that. So, so that's one aspect, but uh, I have these actually here, here uh, kind of separated out. So one thing, first challenge here is that the automatic gain control in the receiver actually scales the receiver chain based on this high power level that it's receiving from the uh, from the, uh, the nearby access point there on the same band. So what happens is that you know you have the output power, then you have some loss here because between the antenna and antenna there is some coupling loss. The further they are, the, you, the better you are off, but if they are close, then the more challenging it is. And then, then this is the kind of noise level across the band and, uh, and uh, then you uh, try to receive at some very low power level here. So, so that's, you know, that's what uh, basically, basically, um, oh, now I kind of got mixed. So, so this one is about the automatic gain control. So, so this signal levels the automatic gain control signal uh, amplification, and that impacts the receiving the, uh, of the actual you know, signal that you want to receive. So, so that kind of decreased sensitivity. The second one is the wideband noise, what I already kind of uh, briefly covered. So, so you have this one transmitting at full power while this one is trying to receive. So then there is uh, the coupling between the antennas. That's much how you, you know, get uh, you know, help. Uh, but, uh, but when these are clo on close by channels, this noise is tapering off gradually. So, so, uh, so you will be having increased noise floor on this channel where you try to receive when, when, uh, when the other one is transmitting at the same time. So there you get some degradation in sensitivity uh, in the other receiver. So those two factors can impact to this, you know. And then there are so many variables related to it. And as well, the receiver and transmitter architectures do have impact how much these kind of factors impact to the performance, like whether you, how close you have the access point if they are being you know, tested here, how close uh, you know, are the clients. So it, it depends on a number of factors whether uh, the performance is, is degraded or not. But those two, um, aspects play a role uh, if you try to co-locate, you know, transmitters nearby to the same band. Okay, so, I mean, overall, of course, Wi-Fi is very complex system of subsystems. So there are the chips, there are, you know, the, um, the kind of the MAC protocol, and then there's the baseband processing, and then there is the you know, the system of these subsystems 
you have a ton of these access points and clients trying to talk to each other and everything impacts to everything. So it's a, it's a, it's a chaos kind of. But uh, you, you need to somehow try to manage it at the system level. So, so there are significant dif differences on how different you know, terminals uh, perform. So it's good to be you know, aware of those, stay on top of those. Those differences can be caused by the firmware, hardware, software, you know, number of things. And they are, of course, changing all the time when you have new software versions. So uh, it's important to somehow be able to um, you know, see what's happening in the network. How are different devices working? How are different access points working? And, and uh, using matrices to track uh, how your networks is performing, how your clients are doing, is, is, is the kind of systematic way of, of uh, of trying to stay on top of all this complexity. All right, thank you. That's uh, that's all. Thank you, sir. I any questions? Incoming. Mic on. Oh, Scott's coming. White screen, traps clean. Um, this relates very much to, I think, the, the short talk that GT gave earlier about dual, dual uh, uh, same band radios. To what extent? Is that mitigated by having external directional antennas where the back lobes are facing each other, as opposed to omnidirectional antennas? Because that's where the cu coupling is, right? Mm. I don't think we're talking about coupling in the circuit board. We're talking about coupling at the antenna. Is that correct? Well, there, there is uh, depending. You know, there there is coupling in the circuit board as well. But I'd say you know the traces are here, uh, you know, nearby. So there is some limited attenuation between them. But I'd say that the the really the important coupling me mechanism is between the antennas. So if you can minimize the coupling between the antennas, that will help you. But there, it's, there, there are you know, limits, of course, to that, how much you can get. You, if, if the antennas are this close to each other, you know, how do you do uh, directional antennas with uh, 20 dB gain pointing to different directions? That's going to be hard. But you can use cross-polarization, for example. That will help a little bit. But of course, when you bring then something close to this access point, uh, you know, the cross polarization actually gets twisted, and then it, it, then the coupling varies. Uh, if if you bring some metal or something reflective close to this uh, this access point, so but there are ways to try to minimize that and maximize the coupling. But uh, these are the you know the hard aspects that you need to face when you are operating two transmitters nearby. Any other questions? There you go. Good one. Yeah, um, I've noticed in your example you used uh, channel 36 and channel uh, 60. So I was wondering, and then you reduce it by 30 dBm. So what if you if you used Uni3, would you have the same effect? Or, for example, using channel 36 and something on the Uni3 band? Yes. So, so the distance will help. So the more distance you have between the, you know, the frequencies, that will help. But uh, of course, the receiver and transmitter operate. They put out the same power levels. Of course, there are some differences in regulation, but, uh, but they put essentially the same power level on different channels. They, receivers have the same amplification on different channels because you, your, you know, uh, radios need to work across the, all the channels, but the wideband noise tapers off when you go further away. Um, if you would be able to use a filter there, you could filter out just to transmit this, but that kind of tunable filters are very hard to do in practice. But, uh, you know, distance helps. Physical distance and, uh, and uh, you know, frequency domain distance, uh, th those two things do help. Anyone else? All right. A um, couple questions for you. What's the typical IF frequency of a AP? Are they all the same? 
I don't have a detailed information. I think it's chipset specific. So obviously when you use a chipset, the high frequency is, uh, you know, the same for all the chipsets. And uh, if you look at the APs, uh, there are APs which are done based on the manufacturer uh, reference design. So it's just the same layout, same circuitry, same everything that the manufacturer, chip manufacturer basically provides for evaluating and using the chipset. Then there are layouts which can be under designs which are custom made, uh, you know, to meet the specific needs or improve the, how it works. So, so it all depends. There is no standard IF frequency uh, to my knowledge. But do you know generally like how many multiplier it is up to get, get you up to two, four, and five? Or like is it in the five, six hundred megahertz range or is it down in the I, I would think, you know, you need to have 80 megahertz or 160 megahertz channels. So, so you need to have at least, uh, if it's 160 megahertz channels, the IF frequency has to be at least, you know, at the minimum, then 80 megahertz so that you can have full band there, uh, you know, modulated spectrum. But I, I would think it is, it is higher than that. Another question I have is, how much adjacent channel rejection do you see of a typical Wi-Fi receiver? Can you say again, please? Adjacent channel rejection. The right. receiver itself. What do you typically see? How many dB is a typical Wi-Fi receiver rejecting on an adjacent channel? Right. So, uh, so I don't have any specific numbers there, uh, but uh, it varies, of course, uh, between the chipsets and manufacturers quite a bit. Uh, there, um, the type approval itself doesn't require uh, much for the for the receiver side. Uh, FCC is only interested in what, what goes out, basically, so that you don't disturb other ones or your one AP doesn't, you know, uh, you know, bleed over to the other channel too much. But for the receiver side, how much, you know, how much higher the next channel can be so that you can uh, decode the other channel uh, properly, FCC isn't so interested in that because it's kind of, it, it, it doesn't impact others, it just impacts yourself. Is there a spec for the code channel? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I'm sure IEEE, yeah, IEEE probably has a spec FCC, I don't think so. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We're moving on. Uh